So we're here today with Will Delaney. Um, Will's one of my friends. We met through the crypto club and today we're going to be talking about crypto, the state of crypto, and then we're also going to kind of dive into decentralized finance and then some of the implications that censorship could have on both the crypto space, but also on just society and the economies in general. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Yeah, it's for sure. Good to be uh, good to be here. So, you want, to, you want to give a little, uh, brief background on yourself? Oh yeah, sure. So my name is Will Delaney. <clears throat> I'm a junior at Purdue University studying industrial engineering. I'm a part of Boiler Blockchain here, as well as ZBT, which is our fraternity. Um, got into crypto. I want to say May of 2020. Kind of rode that up to Bitcoin being around 70,000. Uh, got into DeFi and all things alike. Kind of have just been in the space since. Nice, yeah. nice. All right. Uh, so yeah, you want to state of crypto? Let's do it. So state of crypto. So do we want to go over like FTX, kind of some of the market crash that just happened? Yeah. And kind of like where are we? You know? Yeah. So I think uh, before, like, if you look at crypto a year ago, it's very different, obviously, than it is now, and it's because of those big events that everyone knows of, like the Luna blockchain crash or uh, FTX that ha- crash slash hack. Um, those events really have shaped people's trust in cryptocurrency and at least from what I've seen people no longer see it as like a new asset a lot of people believe crypto is a scam and really lacks that like trust aspect Um, which rightfully so right we've seen billions and billions and billions of dollars time after time again just get taken out of people's hands yeah there's nothing they can do about it Mm -hmm. and so we've seen that reflected in people's ability to, or not ability, but desire to invest in crypto and learn more is just dropped, which right. I think in the future will change as some of these regulations and stuff we can talk about later. Mm-hmm. But And you mentioned the billions of dollars being wiped out of people's hands. Like that happened in two different, like despite two different distinct mechanisms. The yeah. first is like, right. I think what you're talking about is how there's been hacks and how people have lost funds because yeah. they've been stolen from exchanges. Then the other part is that you just the market capitalization of, of things have been wiped out because people don't trust it anymore. They don't want to keep their money there. Exactly. Yeah. So like with the FTX crash, uh, I say crash, but that was more of a fraud situation where people had thought that they were using a trustworthy exchange that had partnerships with yeah. the Miami Heat Stadium, uh, Tom Brady, all these celebrities alike. It seemed very trustworthy, but in reality, none of what was actually going on was true. And... It was pretty much like it was all fake, right? The right. money wasn't real. Um, it was just a classic case of fraud. Whereas with uh, Luna Terra and that blockchain, it was actually more of a failure of the mechanisms built into um, Luna specifically, the Terra stablecoin and the Anchor uh, yeah. protocol, which was a decentralized application that allowed users to deposit uh, Terra and earn a very high yield somewhere between, I believe it was 18% at the time of crash. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was something crazy. Because I remember looking at it, I was like, there's no way. Yeah, it was that, absurd. That is, it was absurd, thing. right? Yeah. And a lot of people thought, like, that's an absurd yield. But no one thought that that one dApp would lead to the uh, this dissolvement of a $40 billion blockchain, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's what happened. I believe this hedge fund came in, saw an opportunity to make some money, uh, caused the Bitcoin of caused the price of Bitcoin to crash. This hedge mm-hmm. fund shorted Bitcoin, so they made money off of that. And if, if there's a way for someone to make money, they're gonna take advantage of it. So it was only a matter of time before that crashed. That really distru- made people distrust stablecoins specifically. And in my opinion, stablecoins are required for the growth of crypto and DeFi and all things alike. So mm-hmm. people distrusting stablecoins really kind of put a halt to all of that. And right. then- Because stablecoins are the backbone in a lot yeah. of ways of the crypto, like- just the crypto sphere in general. Yeah, exactly. You can't have a system uh, built around cryptocurrencies that fluctuate in price 20% a day. And that's not as common with Bitcoin, but it used to be more fluctuation was common in the past. Still, you're seeing these massive price swaps that make it almost impossible to build uh, financial applications off of. That's why you need these stable mm-hmm. coins to keep that price stable. Yeah, it's hard too, because like one of the properties of good money is that good money is supposed to be, it, you're it's supposed to be able to use money as a medium of exchange. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So it's store value, medium of exchange. Yeah. And, but that whole facet of being a store of value is kind of um, not exactly implemented correctly. Like right. It's not implemented in Bitcoin because it has a free floating price. Right. Um, at least in the short term. Yeah. But then also that if you don't have a, store, a good store of value, that hinders the next property of money, which is being a good medium of exchange. Exactly. Um, but yeah. 
Yeah, so between those two events, I feel like people all, all around the world just don't really trust crypto, and we've seen that. Uh, we've seen wallet a number of new wallets registered drop significantly. Uh, mm -hmm. Total locked value in DeFi has dropped. Just the prices of everything have dropped. Um, but I do think that's temporary. I think there are paths for crypto to come back. I yeah. think it might not come back in the same sense that people see it as um, or saw it as, but I, I definitely still think it's a very relevant technology. 100%, yeah, I'm with you on that. And there's a cool conceptual model that A16Z has mm -hmm. for it, and they talk about the different like seasons. Yeah. Um, and there's sort of like this crypto winter, then there's a crypto summer. Yep. But um, during the, the winter, like the people who keep building, who generate new technology, who find new applications of crypto, they set the stage for the next crypto summer. And yep. each crypto summer, it attracts new people in mm -hmm. that then go ahead and build new applications with new utility, which generates new hype, which brings more people in, yeah. which leads to overvaluations, and then the cycle yep. continues. Exactly. And like... And that's kind of my conceptual model for it. Yeah. But you, you kind of, you think about it in the same way, sort of? Yeah, definitely. I think the cycles of like winters and summers, uh, you've seen that in the past. It, it also is very intertwined with the Bitcoin halving cycle, I think. Uh, yeah. Those events like when Bitcoin halves can spark a summer, I would say. Um, the DeFi summer of 2020, that's when I really got interested in stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was built, all of those applications were built 2017, 18, 19. Yeah. That's what got me into it. And then now here I am during the crypto winter, hopefully doing yeah. something important. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was into it and I first kind of heard about crypto in 2016, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually sort of get super involved until um, 2017, which yeah. is when I started buying. And I experienced the whole, you know, 2018 yep. kind of crash, but I made a promise to myself that I'd stick around and check in on the price of Bitcoin, you know, every week. And, but at that same amount of time, uh, I, I, I've been buying a little bit in 2019, right. but in 2020 is when I really like, that's when I really doubled down. Yeah. I spent a lot of time, you know, investing. Yeah. And once you start going down that wormhole, you like, you realize that there's a lot more than you thought was there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then you yeah. come out years later and you're like, wow, okay. Like there's so many applications. Yeah, and I feel like that's kind of like lost. People are talking about cryptocurrency, but they're looking at, the, at it through the lens of I want to make money, yep. not through the lens of where are the actual applications of crypto. Yeah, and there's a lot. Oh, there's so many. There's yeah. thousands, thousands. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything that has to do with authentication. Yep. Um, anything that has to do with secure communication, mm -hmm. security, with trust. Yeah. Do anything like, from what I've seen at least, and I do a lot of stuff in DeFi. Every kind of application that you think of in traditional finance is being replicated on the blockchain and also just in traditional life. Like, I've seen people try to replicate kind of like YouTube mm -hmm. to make it a decentralized version. Um, there's tons, not tons, but there's a handful of email providers that use ENS domains now. So fully decentralized. Uh, we saw Brave, which is a browser. They've kind of built from the ground up a fully decentralized browser to compete with Google, which I think is... Uh, amazing. Yeah, I just I noticed their brow. I've been using the Brave, um, like, uh, the Brave brow browser for a yes. while. But their actual um, like search engine. Yeah. I didn't I didn't actually know they had a search engine until a few like weeks ago. I started yeah. using it. Is that when it came out? Or? So it came out. The search engine came out a couple months ago. Um, I kind of go on and off because there are like this kind of brings up another important point. The downsides to centralization and uh, like everything being run by one person yeah is that that person can, has access to everything and very manipulative right. but it makes stuff run smoother and more efficiently and it's seen in google right like their search engine is amazing because of how much data they have on you and all that stuff yeah they can tell you what you like what you want to know right with brave they don't have access to that data so their search engine is limited um it also has not been trained the same way google's has for the last decade mm -hmm. but in the last couple of months i've seen their search engine get much better yeah much better and i can i'm very excited to see the progress yeah yeah it's cool i'm, I'm happy to use something I, I love google right google's yeah. great um but i'm happy to use to have an alternative as well oh yeah i've always been disappointed with DuckDuckGo. so yeah. no one has the data which is the issue so you gotta create a new model to make it work, which is what Brave is working on. Which yeah. I, I'm very supportive of Brave. Yeah, it'd be cool. I have to do some research in that area because as you know, like I've pivoted a little bit from crypto and I'm trying to do more in e-commerce now. Right. And so looking into SEO and... Um, yeah. I know it kind of brings up a random topic, but I'm trying to remember the name. There was a browser before Brave. Yeah. Uh, it was a decentralized browser. Uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but 
the way that they did SEO and marketing was very different. They had a token, and um, hopefully the name will come to me, but you could stake their token, their browser token, and under a keyword. Hmm. And if you had the most staked under that keyword, your result would pop up first as like the ad. Oh, yeah? So that was the only way to advertise oh, was through okay. that. That's cool. So, I like that model. Um, yeah, it was totally different. What, um, how, like, how did, how did that work? Like, So I, I was thinking about getting into it. Um, I never actually kind of like dove super deep, yeah. but you can buy like a validator and actually run your own uh, yeah. search results. So yeah. the same way that like crypto nodes run transactions, same system, but for a browser. Uh, and you can set that up and earn rewards, yeah. stake those coins. It's a very similar tokenomics model to a lot of the other stuff we've seen, but made for a browser, which mm -hmm. is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of like other stuff that they're going to start to do with this mm -hmm. kind of technology. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. What do you think some of the, um, what do you think some of like the paths forward would look like? Yeah, so that's uh, definitely a harder question. In, in crypto in general, I, there's also like this cliche kind of like model where it's, you know, it was the same thing actually from dot com. You just put dot com on the end of it. Yep. And, but for crypto, it's like, just do this, but in, in crypto, you know? Yep. What if you could build a bank, but in crypto? And yeah. that's been kind of like the, the model because there's so much stuff happening. Yeah. Um, but like the reality is, if you're going to compete with the network effects of Web2 companies, you need to really have some good... Um, some good incentives like yeah. where do the competitive advantages for crypto really start to show themselves over um some of those traditional like web 2 companies yeah so i think uh by the way but the last podcast i did um i've been like putting my my cup down on the table and it was like hard oh, to edit okay. out okay but I, yeah okay i'll put that on the floor i yeah. got you yeah yeah thanks for um, i would say a couple things before we talk about like the paths one of the big things I'm looking for is for there to be a true Web3 environment, it needs to be all run on Web3. And for the time being, um, the whole internet is run by Amazon. Not the whole internet, I'm sorry. Well, a lot of it uh, is, most, right? You can call it yeah, majority. Amazon yes. Web Servers? Yes, yeah. exactly. And so, AWS. in my mind, you really, like, this is all temporary. Okay. Like, this this is not the final stage. It can't be because yeah. it's just run on a Web2 thing. So, first steps would be, like, there's gonna be a company that competes with Amazon Web Service, but Web3. That's what I'm looking for. I think yeah. that's when it comes out, gonna be a very good investment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't know how that's possible being decentralized. Like, yeah. there's definitely a lot of gaps. Full stack internet, full stack decentralized internet. That's, that's, that's the vision of Web3. Because um, mm -hmm. right now, Web3 doesn't work amazing because it's yeah. built on top of Web2. And depending upon how you like, define it yes um you know, it's like the higher layers of the internet that are we're decentralizing but yeah. it's still like the servers and yeah i and mean we've, we've seen a decentralization of the internet before with the tor browser that was i believe made by the cia um i think it was just navy i thought it was the navy, navy some sort of american uh agency government agency yeah. yeah um but yeah so who knows what we'll see in the future uh that it's definitely gonna be interesting uh so yeah besides looking for like an amazon web service competitor I see a couple paths, uh, and obviously, I can't predict the future. Yeah. Uh, I would not recommend anyone take this as financial advice. Yeah, yeah, not financial advice. Not financial advice. Don't uh, sue us, please. This is just my opinion from what I've seen, but there's been, like three main kind of trains of thought, and one revolves around what we've seen in China with central banking digital currencies, CBDCs, and that whole kind of rhetoric. It's kind of unclear on what America's stance are exactly on this, but in the last couple of days, um, I did see some sort of bill go through, uh, an American defense bill, which says a lot, I think, that it's a defense issue now, mm -hmm. uh, talking about the innovations of blockchain, central banking digital currencies and their implications, um, and all things in between. And it kind of, I haven't had a chance to read it, I'm sure it's very long, but it, I, from what I've heard, walks through like a setup structure of this CBDC era, um, and that would be that would be a very interesting future. I don't want to speculate on what that would look like for America specifically, but I will talk about what that looks like in China. Um, and in China, like right now, this is already uh, in existence. They have the digital yen. Yeah, that is their central banking digital currency, and. There are some benefits. I think that that already exists. They already have a digital. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is a. Uh, I think there's over 100 countries that have already looked at looking into 
uh, or plant, not, not even plan to, have or are looking into CBDCs, already over 100, and uh, dozens more that are looking in, like going to look into it. So, yeah. mature, like, that's the thing I don't think people understand is like a majority of countries are already looking into this stuff. Mm -hmm. And when it uh, comes to fruition, I think it's going to be very quick. People aren't going to realize what happens, and that kind of future will just be set in place with not much resistance. Um, but back to, Ch back to China, um, so they use some sort of, it's not a full CBDC because they do have the digital or the physical dollar still, um, okay. but it's the closest we've seen to a functioning system. And uh, people are, I'm sure are familiar with their social credit system, um, but it does give them the ability to track every single purchase made with that CBDC. That's that's really scary, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the social credit system is like, that's 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 pretty wild. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a scary future. Mm -hmm. um, and and I don't think people like understand, but like, Bitcoin is not it's not anonymous. It's pseudo anonymous. Yeah. And so other currencies like ETH as well, they're pseudo anonymous, where you can see um, people. It's just that the link from the physical world to the digital world doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. Yes. But if you can bridge that, first of all, like you know everything there is to know about that person, yeah. every transaction they've ever done, their balances. Yeah. You know. Um, but then the, the flip side to that is, all right, well, you can have a, digi a digital identity, which is separated from your physical one. And that's yeah. cool. There's a ton of advantages yeah. to that. Um, it, there's, a, there's ways we can create credit scores that are, you know, better yep. equipped. More, uh, re more reliable. Exactly. More reliable because they have more data to draw on. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting train of thought. Um, yeah. But then again, on the flip side, you get... Right. Uh, if the if the real world identities are bridged to the blockchain, that's where I think. Yeah, I, I think that gap is already made. Like, yeah, you see YouTube is like Coffeezilla. Like, the second a big scam comes out, like mm -hmm. you can get to the bottom of it. And there's already websites. I don't know the name again, but yeah. there's a website out there that you type in one wallet address, and it will go through every transaction and make a map mm -hmm. of all the wallets you've interacted with. And so, wow, you do that. Bam, your entire blockchain history is right there. Yeah. You just got to connect one of those to a centralized exchange. Bam, you're identified. So it's Dang. really not that hard right now. Um, got to be careful about Tornado Cash. Yeah, yeah. And that we can talk about that later. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting. Because um, I, like, I know in China, if you use your money and gamble, mm -hmm. the government will see that. And Is the gambling allowed there? Or? Gambling's allowed, but I, I don't... I, actually, I, I'm, I, I don't know 100%. Okay. But yeah. I know people gamble. Everyone gambles. Not everyone gambles, but... People do all yeah. across the world, everywhere, yeah. um, and I know that like that's a activity that's seen poorly by society, and so it'll actually impact your social credit score. So that's how they link like uh -oh. your financial transactions to like your real life. Low enough mm -hmm. for social credit score, you can't leave the country, you can't travel on planes, uh, yeah. stuff like that. So that's one path. Um, if you want to learn more, just see what's going on in China. I think yeah. that's probably the best way to see that. Yeah, well, one way that I've kind of thought about this is like. I kind of imagine, sometimes I'll articulate a particular conceptual model or a framework to explain something, but I'll, I'll explain it like in my own words, from yeah. my own experiences. And just with like finance in general, I've always seen finance as a mechanism for communication. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different kind of communication than like language or mathematics, but um, it does allow you to like articulate things, but though that articulation creates can create like it's like a form of power almost yeah um where you can you can do things and that has a, a realized effect right instead of just transferring like information you're transferring like economic value yeah and cryptocurrency in general i see that as a way to you know create a new way of, of financial communication mm -hmm. that's secured by like cryptography and that has all of the rules and properties of good money of good yeah economic exchange the thing is is that the that we could create like systems that know so much about you and about what you can do mm -hmm. that you could create like omnipotent um sort of agencies where they just like they know everything there is to know about you yeah. and they become like all powerful because of that knowledge yeah. and it's all captured by the internet and so like i for me at least this idea of privacy this idea of secure of of security, one of the ways which security is realized is through privacy, mm -hmm. is super super important. Yeah, and and yeah, you're right. Like, there's some real dystopian futures yeah. that we could realize if we're not careful about 
being conscious about the ways we selectively reveal ourselves to, yep. to go to um, hues, air cues. Yep. But yeah, got to be careful in that kind of area. Mm -hmm. um, so besides that kind of future, what are some of the other options? Um, one thing I want to highlight would be a, a future where like our traditional financial system yeah. is kind of continuing down this path, right? The American dollar fiat system remains the world's international monetary uh, reserve. But something weird might happen with Bitcoin specifically. Um, in a couple of years, I think they're going to get ready for a smart contract layer after mm -hmm. uh, all this stuff with the, the lightning layers figured out. And we, we, we have we, uh, the taproot upgrade. Yeah, the taproot. Is that smart contract? Yeah, I think. So. Yeah, uh, smart contracts on Bitcoin. Is it is it fully launched yet? I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Okay, I don't. I'll, I'll have to check. I, I didn't think it was from when I talked to Andrew last. Um, okay. But regardless, I think a rise of Bitcoin smart contract applications, okay. dApps, could well, be I, in the future. My bad. Maybe it was it was finished or like part of it was implemented. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, not super important. Okay. I can see it rising in the future. It yeah. doesn't exist right now, I don't think. Like okay. the specific dApps. So what I'm thinking of is right now decentralized finance is run on Ethereum. Right. Um, everything else is a knockoff of Ethereum and how they're running it. Not a knockoff, but it's just... It's based around Ethereum. So, so like the different smart contract platforms, so things like Sol and APS yeah. and whatever. Um, they, they're, they're real big on the proof of stake type stuff. Yes. And, and the issue with that is that we're moving away from like a meritocratic sort of like more individualistic resource intensive like meritocracy. Yeah. Where like where, Solana has hyper nodes, I believe 32 yeah. of them, um, maybe super nodes, super valid, whatever the word mm -hmm. is, but they're like set apart from the rest. Yeah. They control the majority of it. So it's so long as pretty centralized. Ethereum, uh, they've gotten cracked down in the future or in the past with Tornado Cash. But Bitcoin is Well not Ethereum, but like some of the dApps on Ethereum. Yeah, I would classify that as Ethereum getting cracked down too though. Like okay. the stuff under Ethereum like what, what do you mean by that? So yeah, I guess we, if you take a step back. Because I've always thought of Ethereum as being fairly decentralized. Okay. So I, I understand I understand like with POS there's been yeah. there's been some controversy around that, but I don't, I don't really understand that. So what? So like, and so it's not necessarily centralized, but the hands of a centralized authority are very much in Ethereum and anything that comes under it. And so under it would be uh, Aave, all of those D apps, right? Like Uniswap. They all exist on the other blockchains now, but in my mind, they started on Ethereum. Right? Yeah, they all did. Yeah. Um, so if you, let's say, bought $100 of some stable coin and washed it through Tornado Cash. Right. That's worthless and now. Like you can't use that anywhere. That crypto because it was washed through Tornado Cash and your address was added to a list uh, Office of Financial Affairs Regulations. I'm not sure the exact abbreviation. And this list keeps track of everyone and all the money and it's all bad money like laundered. So to me, like, there's already a centralized authority pretty much overwatching everything that happens on Ethereum. And so uh, yeah. if DeFi progresses, um, the rise of DeFi, decentralized finance would lead to the downfall of a centralized authority that, in my mind, the number one centralized authority for monetary policy is the Federal Reserve in America. Right. Because the whole world runs on the American dollar. Yeah, petrodollar standard. So who uh, stands to lose the most? Federal okay. Reserve. So rise of DeFi, fall of the Federal Reserve. They're not gonna let that happen. So if they can stop it, they will. But couldn't they just create like a CBDC? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's okay. why that kind of scenario was more um, more probable. More pro in in your mind. I could see that being a pretty like I list I, that as my number one. Like, I, de I definitely see that as being very probable. Especially after like the last couple of days with that defense bill. Um, I could see if I could yeah. get the name one, of that. One more thing. So I'm kind of so Bitcoin uses UTXO model. So UTXO unspent transaction output. But each coin is like unique. Yeah. In, in some sense, they're fungible, but right. they're they're unique, um, at least in terms of the transaction history. Yeah. For ETH, if I'm not mistaken, ETH runs on an account-based model, right? Mm -hmm. So, they're blacklisting people based on the address that the addresses. So they see it came from Tornado Cash to this address. But, e but how do they blacklist the coins? Or are they blacklisting the coins or the addresses? Yeah. So it's 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 the addresses that touch the coins and also like those coins too. I'm not sure the specific mechanics, but like okay. 
you can have like bad Ethereum that has been washed through Tornado Cash, and you can't really like. Really? I'm not sure the exact. Again, I've never done this. Okay. Uh, this is not an issue that I personally face. You're innocent. Yes. Um, but there's a. I'm not sure if you if you have those coins, yeah. will it turn your wallet bad, or if you just won't be able to withdraw those coins. Um, but there's some sort of something like that. Okay, so it's either the wallet or it's the coin. Yeah, or I, sort of I, something in between. I want to say it's both. I want to okay. say it's both. Um, okay, so I'll have to do more research because I don't. I don't, from my current understanding of ETH, I don't understand how the coins would be, um, be able to be flagged because I thought it was an account based model. Yeah, I. So I could see how they could do it with the dresses, but the. I think it has something to do with. Is it like USDC or it's like ETH? USDC. Okay, okay, because USDC, I could, I could see, I know, I know. I'm pretty yeah, yeah, yeah that's what it is. So, because it's run by Circle, that's centralized. Uh, yeah. USDC, very easy. But, but it's back, USDC is backed by FDIC, right? It's FDIC insured. USDC is? Some of it is. Some the of derivative it? on the Ethereum blockchain is something weird. I, okay, okay. There's something weird because, like, it's the same with uh, BUSD. If you have BUSD on the Ethereum blockchain, that's issued by Paxos, which is FDIC insured. Oh, okay. But BUSD on every other blockchain, including Binance, yeah, is not the same. It's a derivative. Binance Smart Chain. Yeah. Uh, so that only is real. Like it's real everywhere, but right. insured on Ethereum. Interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, back to like the past of the future. So you got the Bitcoin one, the second one that we're talking about right now, um, the rise of like a Bitcoin DeFi kind of era, just because it's harder to censor and stop than Ethereum is. Right. Um, and that would kind of just look like more and more people using that, less people using other traditional finance systems. A third kind of path would be some sort of, uh, like, have you, I, have you read the book Ray Dalio's Changing World Order? Um, I haven't seen the book, but I saw his YouTube, YouTube video. Yeah, I, I watched the YouTube video as well. I read um, Principles. So yeah, good. yeah, it's great. Some sort of event like that, that... Uh, I can't even begin to predict what it would look like, but... Some sort of black swan. Yeah, and uh, something that would cause the U.S. dollar to fall a lot. Uh, there's a lot of conflict in the world, so it's not an unreasonable thing to think. Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, I believe there's, there's like five or six countries, South America, or South Africa, Brazil is one of them, I think, that are banding together to try to rival the U.S. dollar with some sort of joint currency. That event would also classify as like a black swan. Uh, something like that. China, obviously, like their economy is growing. I think they're only a couple, I don't know how many trillion behind GDP, but okay. it's, uh, it's it, a lot. I want to say it's like four trillion behind us, five. I think they're at like 16 and we're at like 21. Wow. Okay. At least from w something I saw recently, I don't know if that chart so they're, they're catching up. Oh, 100%. But I mean, that's not to say China does not have issues right now. Their housing market is uh, a mess. Uh, they've got they've got issues. They've got issues for sure. Same as us. Same as everyone. Um, but yeah, besides those three paths, like something in between, both one. For me, the most probable is that we have one. It could be USD, like you know, like digital dollar, yep. Bitcoin, whatever. But then we kind of just have like a like a power law distribution of mm -hmm. other chains that are used, um, and that's just kind of like the Pareto distribution, but like the Pareto principle kind of imposed, implemented in this area. Yeah, I I definitely think other chains will emerge, new ones that we can't think of yet. Um, yeah. Some will probably stick around. Same thing with the internet.com bubble. Um, yeah. Very similar, but it, it will be different in some senses because regulation is very different in terms of financial stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of regulation issues in the beginning of the internet, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, so maybe looking to the past will give us some of the answers. Yeah. I haven't looked at regulation on the dot-com bubble crash, but yeah. I'd be curious to see. Kind of how that... How that uh, it comes to fruition. Yeah, yeah. If, that, if anything kind of happened that led to certain companies going under or anything like that. Yeah. So what about, so what else? Um, I'd say another big like thing of crypto that you're going to see is education. Um, I know Texas, uh, the, the major, I'm not sure exactly that. You Texas know. is cool. I was talking to my friend about, about, yeah, one of the Texas universities, might, might, might have been AM, just launched their first like Bitcoin class um, for credit at the university, accredited. So you'll start to see cryptocurrency kind of like roll into curriculum and mm -hmm. people will start to like understand that 
Not to mention, by the way, if you go to Purdue, perfect transition. We we wrote a whole course on yeah. non-technical blockchain. Yep. Um, we're going to be teaching it this semester. If you haven't signed up and you go to Purdue, go ahead, sign up. You get a certificate in non-technical blockchain. Yep, yep. So it's not for credit. Uh, that hopefully is in the future. But for right now, it's just a certificate. It's going to start in a couple weeks. But yeah. it's fully student developed uh, by people in Boiler Blockchain. Yep. Student led, student taught. Yep. It'll we be got good. me, you, Ian. Andrian, yeah, it's I'm best, excited. be the best course. I, I promise you, if you come, these lectures they will be, they'll be it'll incredible. Be yeah, it'll be good. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, but yeah, I think that's. I don't know if I have anything else to talk about. Yeah, yeah, um, bro. I think that was it. Awesome. That was, that was a great conversation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me again. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I'll uh, again. We'll we'll be working together over the course. Oh, yeah. Um, hopefully, we can have some more guests on in the future. Definitely, I'd love to be back at some point. Absolutely. Thank you, man. All right. See you.